All right, folks, welcome back. I'm Jake Ellen Bogan. And in this episode or this video, rather, we are going to be talking about my takeaways from this game. The Rams beating the Vikings 30 to 20. Um, I had a chance to sleep on it quite literally, finally. So I'm going to be giving you my takeaways, my thoughts, and uh, kind of tie this thing up before we do the live stream. So before we dive into it, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Be sure to follow me on all social media. And check out today's sponsor, BetUS, where you can get 150% bonus match on your first deposit using code YouTube150. And of course, you can get on the next two deposits, 125% bonus match using YouTube150. So be sure to use that promo code YouTube150. And if you do, you can use that on the World Series. You can use that on the NBA, the NHL. It's all back. And then the NFL this Sunday. And then, of course, the Rams game next week against Seattle to try to get back to 500. So YouTube 150 is the code. Always, always remember to bet responsibly and uh, check out BetUS. All right, guys. So here are some of my takeaways in this game. We're going to just go through it all. I'm just going to be honest with you. First off, Matthew Stafford. Let's start from the top. Matthew Stafford had not thrown three touchdowns in a game this season. He threw four in this game. He had an interception that I'm sure he'll want back, but he was spectacular in this game. And when you look and you go back and, and maybe you watch some of my old videos and stuff about, you know, going into this game, you'll remember I said, or maybe you don't, but now I'll remind you. I said the big reason why I felt so good about the Rams versus the Vikings is because the Vikings defense, they use a lot of blitzes. They use exotic looks. They make things hard on quarterbacks, young quarterbacks. But veteran quarterbacks should be able to understand what's going on. And we saw that last week. Jared Goff might be young, right? He might still be a young quarterback. But he's really not. He's been in the league since 2016. He's seen everything the league has to offer. And he did a great job taking nothing away from him. Did a great job against that Vikings defense. Well, sure enough, so did Matthew Stafford. And going into this game, I think the deciding factor is the fact that Matthew Stafford is just a better quarterback than anybody else in the NFC. And so when they threw things at him, he had a counter for it. His only bad decision, like really bad decision, the interception was just him throwing a bad pass. Mechanics, whatever it was, did not throw a great pass and it led to an interception. Let's be honest here. Byron Murphy didn't make some crazy play. He threw it right at Byron Murphy. It was a bad throw. But with that said, Stafford the rest of the way was impeccable. And it's amazing what happens when your two best wide receivers come back from injury, okay? And look, they're still not healthy up front, but we're going to get to that. So Stafford absolutely was a main reason why this team looked as good as it did. And it's just a reminder, Stafford hasn't been playing bad football. He's been doing everything he can, and they have been in games that they shouldn't even be in because of Matthew Stafford's level of play. So he gets a lot of flack because you see him throw a pick at the end of the game against the Bears, you know, chance to win on the final drive. You see him not come through against the uh, Packers in that game. You see him not look great against the Raiders. And you start to think, huh, Stafford, he must be the problem. He's getting up there in age. <clears throat> the mainstream media told me that he's going to start falling off a cliff. He's beat up. He's broken all that. No, that hasn't been it. He just finally needed his weapons back. I think any quarterback needs their supporting cast. It's not just a Stafford thing. Stafford did everything he could. I kept saying they stretched this, this thing out as far as they could. But with no Jordan Whittington especially, they really needed Cooper Cup and or Puka Nakua back. They got them both, and so this is what you see. running ba uh, The running game. I like Blake Corum, but man... It's so different watching Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams is one of the best running backs in the league, if not the best. And I understand, like, people will say, well, hold on a sec, King Henry. Yeah, Derrick Henry is running behind a healthy offensive line. Derrick Henry also has the help of Lamar Jackson at quarterback, who's also a threat to run. So when they run those, you know, they, they have those quarterback options, those read options, it's only going to help Derrick Henry because you have to know where Lamar Jackson is at all times. 
The Rams don't have that with Matthew Stafford. They, they're not a threat. Matthew Stafford's not a threat to run the football. So what Kyron Williams did was really impressive. And this is a defense that has stopped the run all year. But I did say going into this game, this is a defense that struggles against better running backs. Jordan Mason gave them fits. Jameer Gibbs on Sunday gave him fits. And now Kyron Williams uh, gave him fits. And I understand Kyron didn't get to 100 yards. I don't really care. They were selling out to stop the run. That completely changed everything. When they started selling out to stop the run, putting eight and nine guys in the box, run blitzing, it opened up the door for other, you know, play uh, those passes to be made. So, you know, that is the, the benefit of having a really good running back and I don't care what anyone says. The Rams have to find a way to keep Kyron Williams. He's not a dime a dozen. It's not running backs don't matter. This guy is special. And I want to point out something. Uh, Baldinger brought up. I've never seen either. So Baldinger was spot on with this take. I've never seen a running back catch passes out of the backfield with a release where he went in between the pass rusher and the left tackle. That was incredible. That's why he was wide open. People were, you know, Vikings fans on Twitter were probably saying, cover him. Well, you can't. He, You couldn't get enough depth in your, your drop back in coverage because he already had you beat. Incredible stuff by Kyron Williams deserves a lot of credit. Receiving room. What can you say about Puka Nakua that hasn't already been said? Probably nothing. Everything's been said about Puka Nakua. The guy's just special. I think if anybody was wondering if he's a legitimate receiver or if he's a product of the system... I'm hoping last night, if it hadn't already been obvious, last night put any anything like that to bed. Puka Nakua is always wide open. He always finds a way to get open, and he makes these crazy catches near the sidelines. He, he is just a fantastic player. He's an elite receiver, one of the best receivers in football. We saw it last night. His presence and Cooper Cup's presence, ironically, you would have thought Puka Nakua would have been the limited one, not Cooper Cup. It looked like Cup was limited, but Cup caught a touchdown, had a huge catch towards the end of the game to extend a drive. Cup still doesn't look 100%, but that's pretty good considering he's going to have 10 days to get ready for the next game. And furthermore, it's pretty good when you consider the fact that Cooper Cup, I mean, they won the game by 10 and they didn't even need Cooper Cup to go off. Now, a takeaway for the wide receiver room. Demarcus Robinson, shout out to you. Two touchdowns. I gave you hell. I still think he's a product of who's around him. I do. But he came away with the two touchdowns. So shout out to him. Tyler Johnson, I don't know why he's getting playing time over Tutu Atwell. I can understand if people want to say Tutu Atwell, you know, he missed that block last week. It kind of scared the coaching staff a little bit. But how did Tutu Atwell get so few snaps. I, I It's kind of weird to me. I don't love it because he was kind of carrying the wide receiver room uh, on his back, if we're being honest. Atwell is the leading receiver on this team. Um, I, I don't really get it. He only had two targets, caught one of them for you know 18 yards. The other one was an underthrown bomb by Stafford. Um, I Yeah, I just, I don't really get it at this point in time. And I'm hoping, you know, at some point, Atwell is going to be a little bit more respected, but you know, right now I am a little concerned. He only had seven receiving snaps in this game. He was targeted on two out of the seven snaps, which is a good sign, but just a little weird. I'm hoping it, it was just more so the matchup and this isn't going to be how it is moving forward because I really think you're leaving a lot of value on the table Two two Atwell is such a dynamic player and he works so well in unison when you have guys like Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup opening up the deep ball. You saw it. Atwell had his man beat by a mile, and Stafford underthrew him. He's going to have more of those opportunities, but I hope it's not just seven snaps moving forward. We'll see what ends up happening. I do think Jordan Winnington is going to have more of a role. I will tell you that right now uh, because they were utilizing a, a lot of Tyler Johnson to Marcus Robinson. Wouldn't be surprised if Whittington finds his way into the third hole. I really wouldn't. So then you look at the tight ends and they need Tyler Higby back. I don't think that's a shock, but Parkinson came through when needed and Hunter Long. I love that play they drew up. They had three levels. They ran levels and they had three guys, three options, three reads, and it's easy to make. It's just a diagonal. 
and Stafford's looking first guys like right in his face. It's basically just a, a, a check down to the flat. You have that. And he keep in mind, he's also on a bootleg, which I love. I love when he gets on the bootleg. I think he is so dynamic and so dangerous with his arm when he's on the bootleg. But you see that you see the first one. He can hit that. If he's covered, then he can look in the intermediate spot. And if he has it, he can go deep down the field. And those levels allowed him to read the defense quickly, although he can do it normally without a hitch. Um, saw a hunter long that was wide open downfield. 84, hit him in stride. There you go. Nice little chunk of yards, 18 to be exact. Loved that play call. Uh, a lot of the play calls I was really a big fan of. Uh, shout out to Sean McVay. Sometimes it's not really that his play calling is bad. It's more so, hey, I didn't have my two starting wide receivers and my four offensive linemen are out. Um, speaking of offensive line, pass protection, really good. I don't think Justin Dedick or Dedich or Dedick, I don't know how to say his name. Um, I don't think he should be starting, but he kind of has to. And even still, I know he gave up three pressures, but I think he still played a pretty solid level. Um, the Rams only gave up 11 pressures. Matthew Stafford did not hit the ground once on a sack. So big time stuff from the offensive line. They needed to have it. It's just a reminder that just wait till they get Steve Avila. Just wait till they get no boom. Just wait until they get Jonah Jackson. This offensive line is going to be so good. This offense is going to be so good. And you know that because look at what they did last night. Um, thought Alec Jackson is just, he's continued to play well at left tackle. Bo Limmer, the, the penalties were a little annoying. Um, you know, but Bo Limmer came away with, uh, you know, he only gave up one pressure. Uh, Rob Havenstein, he looked great as well. And then, you know, I thought the pass protection reps, I think he only got nine blitz pickup, but Kyron Williams was great per usual. Just really good stuff all in all. Offensive line blocked well. Run blocking was there, was on point. Um, Puka Nakua's presence in the run blocking was pretty obvious in the run game, uh, as well as Cooper Cup. Um, just a reminder that these guys matter in, in that sense. Then you look at the defense, and I just have to say, what a performance by the defense. It wasn't as splashy, okay? It just wasn't as splashy as Sunday, but you're not going to get four turnovers every game. I hope people are aware of that. That's not a common practice, okay? You don't normally get four turnovers every game. When I said that they were going to build off that, I felt like they were going to do what they did last night, but they would be opportunistic. They didn't get a turnover, and that's fine. The reality is this, though. This is a team that is getting better. This is a team that has a rookie defensive coordinator that is getting better, okay? They were not splashy, but they missed, and I have all of these listed here because I do not want to miss a beat here. They missed 10 tackles against the Lions, thought that was their best game of the year until the Raiders game. 10 tackles against the Lions, 21 against the Cardinals, 8 against the 49ers, 10 against the Bears, 11 against the Packers, 7 against Vegas. You know how many tackles they missed last night against the Vikings? Two. Two tackles. They only missed two tackles. Okay, this was the worst run defense in the NFL going into this game. They held the Vikings to 22 carries for 64 yards. Okay, not even three yards a carry. Chris Shula made defensive adjustments on another level. This is a team that comes out strong every single... I think they have a touchdown on almost every single drive this year. On every single uh, first drive of the game this year. And why? Because the Vikings are a good team... But also, they know how, <clears throat> you know, Kevin O'Connell knows how to script a drive. And I said this during the, the watch party. Uh, Kevin O'Connell scripts a drive well. Their scripted drives, two touchdowns. After that, zero touchdowns. Defense made adjustments. They bracketed, uh, you know, Justin Jefferson in the, the red zone. Wasn't able to get out and do any damage. Really impressed uh, with just... Chris Shula, really impressed with the secondary. Um, I don't really know why, but Akella Witherspoon only played nine snaps last night. So did Jalen McAuliffe. I'm going to say that this had a lot to do with just what they were trying to do matchup-wise. I think it's the same thing with Tutu Atwell. It was a little interesting. 50 snaps from Lake, 
50 snaps from Darius Williams, 49 from Kobe Durant, 47 from Roseboom. Jared Verse played 42. Kobe Turner played 41. Byron Young played 39. Cameron Curl 37. Michael Hoyt 31. Um, of course, he was questionable to play. Braden Fisk played 26. Bobby Brown played 25. Omar, split, uh, Omar Spades played almost all in run support, 22 snaps, 14 of which in run support. Josh Wallace played 20. Cameron Kinchins played 14. Of course, you know, Cam Curl got hurt early on in the game, uh, came back. Jonah Williams, first time all year, he played 12 snaps. Jay Cummel played 10. McAuliffe, Tyler Davis, Witherspoon played nine, and Neville Gallimore played eight before he left with an injury. So, surprise, but I think a lot of it had to do with the matchup. Whatever they were trying to accomplish, I think that kind of had something to do with it. Um, I do think you got to have Kello out there more. Uh, that is definitely a takeaway of mine. When Kello was on the field, they didn't score. When Kello was off the field, they scored two touchdowns. Obviously, there's something to go with that. Um, really, really impressed with their cheetah package. A lot of people don't know what that means. I had to go back and look it up. It is Nick Saban's uh, thing. Okay. He did that at Alabama. You have three edge defenders on the field. Doesn't matter where you put them, but you have three edge defenders on the field. So the Rams did that. They put verse, they put young and they put Hoyt out there. I hope people are finally understanding how freaking good Michael Hoyt is. Oh my goodness. He is a good football player. Not great in coverage because you're asking a giant to go and cover Aaron Jones. I don't know what you expect. By the way, great catch by Aaron Jones. But Jared Verse, five pressures. Michael Hoyt had four. Braden Fisk, who only played limited snaps and was banged up, had four pressures. You had three from Byron Young. You had a pressure from Curl and a pressure from Jonah Williams. That puts you at 18 pressures on the quarterback. If you told me that they would add 18 pressures early on in the game, I would have said you were crazy because the reality is that the Vikings came out and that pass protection was lock on. I mean, it was hard. You just, they could not get to Darnold on those first two drives. Things changed. They made adjustments. They blitzed. They tried different things. I also have to point out Christian Darisaw went down with an injury, but at the same time, if you're going to say, well, Darisaw went down with an injury. Now you understand why the Rams almost beat the lions, but didn't. They were starting A.J. R. Curie at left tackle, okay? This is football. Unfortunately, injuries are part of the game. We can sit here. We can complain. The Rams have not had their fair share of injury luck this year, but I'll tell you right now, they are getting this. They're turning this thing around. I hope their saw is okay. I hope he comes back next game. But this is football, and it wasn't just Darisaw, okay? The rest of the offensive line was struggling on the other side as well. The Rams were getting through. They did a great job. They started mixing up some stunts. They were having fun. And keep in mind, this is the the next. So they played, four, uh, they played two games in four days. Uh, really impressive stuff on a short week to get them prepared. Just really impressed with the coaching staff. Uh, really impressed with the players. This looked like a team that was counted out, but never bought into it. And it's a really good sign. So I thought the secondary was on point. I thought the run defense was excellent. I thought you saw great things out of the pass rush. And I have to make mention, I have to make mention because Omar Spates really showed out. Spates immediately looked like the game was too fast for him. He did immediately i was like he's a little shaky but as the game went on he got more and more and more confident this is somebody who had the second highest run defensive grade on the team for this game according to pff only behind bobby brown he did a great job he had a or stop percentage of 7.1 he was really good i don't think he's getting enough attention or talk today but Omar Spates should not see the bench the rest of the year. Not in base. When you're in base 3-4, Omar Spates should be on there at all times. I understand in coverage, yeah, he might not be the best, and I get that, but there's no reason. He's your best run defending linebacker. It is not even close. What I saw from him in run fits, it was obvious this guy is legit. Uh, going back to it, you know, Jalen McAuliffe, Kella Witherspoon were the two top cover guys. They only had eight snaps a piece in coverage. 
We'll see if that continues. I don't think it's going to. I do suspect this game against Seattle, they'll be playing more. I think this was more matchup based. That's just the reality of it. But I was really impressed. I thought Quinton Lake did a great job. Just so many guys to name. Feel really good about this team. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If this team stays healthy and they get their guys back, like an Avila and Tyler Higby and all these guys, I think they're winning the Super Bowl. I, I really, I said it before the season because I looked at this team and I said, well, as long as they stay healthy, they're winning the Super Bowl. They're going to beat the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl. I think they're going to do it. I then switched it, of course, to the Texans, but I think they're going to do it. Um, their coaching is just so underrated. And the reason I say that is because I think people are aware of, you know, Sean McVay's brilliance. I don't think they're aware of how good Chris Shula has been the last two weeks. I don't think they're aware of the job that Eric Yarber does to get these wide receivers prepared. I don't think they're aware of just the job that has been done in the offensive line room. Any other team probably would have quit by now. This team rose to the occasion. They took this as an opportunity. They didn't look at this as, oh man, we're screwed. We're playing the red hot, you know, Vikings. There was no quit in this football team. They played an ugly game last year against the, you know, the Seahawks 17 to 16 at home coming off a bye after losing to the Packers and they went on a huge run this year. I suspect they're going to do the same and guess what? If they win game number four against Seattle, that would be four and four in eight games. They were three and six in nine games last year. They would be ahead of where they were last year when they went on their run. So big things are coming for the Rams as long as they can stay healthy. I am very bullish on this team, and I think they might have found something in Omar Spates. I said it in preseason. I know a lot of you also agreed. I think Spates is legit. I think he, he doesn't even have to be a three down linebacker because I think you can make a move at the deadline, go out and get, you know, whether that's a Devin Lloyd or a Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa or a Jelani Tavai from the New England Patriots. There are a lot of linebackers out there. Bobby Okariki from the Giants, a lot of linebackers, EJ Speed from the Colts. There are different things that you can do. I do think they should go out, make a move. I think they should get a explosive weapon like a David Njoku. I continue to say, I think he would just make their offense insane. And I think going out and getting another linebacker that can help situationally. Uh, and maybe even be that three down linebacker makes a lot of sense as well. But right now, the Rams are three and four. They might as well be four and three with how good they feel. They feel like a team that is about to run roughshod of the NFL. And they feel like a team that the NFL is wishing they lost last night because you want a team like this buried. You do not want to see this team in December. You definitely don't want to see this team in January and you might not want to see this team in February, but those are my thoughts. Those are my takeaways from this game, fun game. And man, it was a fun day hanging out with you guys. We did like four or five live streams. I've already lost count, uh, but just awesome stuff. And uh, I'm excited. We hit 28,000 subscribers. So thank you for that. And of course, special thanks to, uh, bet us for sponsoring today's video i will see you guys on the flip we'll have more inf uh, more information more content all of that but if i don't see you you guys enjoy the mini bye week and we'll be back at it for a week was it nine against the seattle seahawks time flies when you're having fun we'll get to it later folks just want to let you guys know that we are doing all 22 live breakdowns every single week rams football related uh, over on kick exclusively that's kick.com slash JK Bogan. If you want to get in on the action and if you want a little something more than just football, I also do gaming streams as well. So check that out. Link is in the description and hope to see you there. Do you love talking about the Rams, the NFL, or just want to be a part of a community? Join my free Discord server today. We're over 800 members. We got 24-7 live chat, a level 3 boosted server, the ability to call into JE Live, playing online games with us on kick streams, toggleable alerts for when I go live on YouTube or kick so you don't miss a live stream, and exclusive giveaways. Click the link in the description, the comments section, or the link that comes up in the video to learn more and join today.